On the surface, he is the living embodiment of the classic all-American man. He's tall, was blessed with leading man good looks, has degrees from the best schools, and has ascended to the very apex of the C-suite of an American-based global financial services company. He's also a leader who has used his power and privilege, privilege largely assumed by virtue of his birth, to champion and propel measurable cultural change in the workplace he leads. And in doing so, he and his company have become the white paper of sorts that other leaders and other companies are carefully and critically spying as they address and assess their own efforts to reimagine the workplace, more specifically, how they go about infusing diversity, equity, and inclusion, DEI, into the DNA of their companies and organizations. Please join me and my very special guest, the CEO of Discover Financial Services, Roger Hothschild, in the arena right now. Three, two, one. Roger Hochschild, how are you, my friend? Very good. My fellow six foot three in. That's what we're just exactly. going to do. Exactly, and shrinking though. And, uh, as 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 am I, sir. Um, but yeah. again, you and I talked about this in our pre-interview. My identity has been six three, and I don't care what my doctor or anyone else says. We are six three, and that's that's how I walk through the world. Agree. Let's begin at the beginning with you. Um, when and where were you born? So I was born in San Francisco, California, in 1964. Tell me about the woman and man who created you. So um, my mom, Christy Hochschild, uh, was born, gosh, late 30s. Mm. And uh, her parents were divorced, which was rare at the time. Okay. And she grew up on a horse farm in Virginia. Mm. Uh, pretty isolated upbringing. She talked about riding her horse uh, into town six miles to watch a movie. Um, so. Started with a love of animals, mm. went off to boarding school, uh, then to college, uh, and then went to work in New York. Your mom? Yeah. Okay. Is that where she met your father? That's where she met my dad. Okay. So, Tell me about him. So he was born in Cape Town, South Africa, went to University of Cape Town. Um, from a very young age, he said he knew he wanted to move to America. Mm. Um, and he had had a bit of a challenging upbringing. Uh, he was the third son, and I think his mother had wanted a daughter. Um, and so was sent off to boarding school at age eight, mm -hmm. uh, which is common in the, the British system, which they followed. Uh, tough experience there. He was known as Jew boy in boarding school. And so um, I think was eager to leave South Africa and uh, come to the U.S. Wow, patterns already setting in. You have one sister? One sister, Older? Yes. Yes. How much older? Um, she is about 17 months older, Francis. Ah, so, so similar to my siblings and I, we're 18 months, 18 months, 18 months. Oh, and God. then 13 years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. <laughs> no judgment. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, what was the relationship between the two of you uh, growing up? We were, so I'll, I'll talk about the four of us because okay. it impacted the two okay. of us, a very close family. Uh, my parents both had their own businesses. Mm. And um, your mom had her own business. Yes, she imported stones, uh, semi-precious stones from South Africa. You said your mom was born in the thirties. Uh, yes. Okay, a bit so, of a pioneering spirit, I would imagine, in that. In that very time. much so. Yeah. Very independent-minded. Okay. Um, and your father and so, liked that. Yes. Good. And um, and she needed to be to to deal with him. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but they, um, she had a business called Hawks Rocks where she sold uh, semi-precious stones to gem stores and retailers. Mm. Um, but we were a very close family. And so their idea of a good time was just us. They mm. didn't have that many friends or a broad social network. And so my sister and I spent a lot of time together, probably in, in high school and college. You know, she was two grades ahead, okay. and that makes more of a difference then. Um, but uh, so drifted apart a bit. She moved to New York um, after college. And then, um, but we're very close now. We'll talk at least four or five times a week, oh, wow. and I'm going out to visit her uh, this weekend. Very nice, very nice. 
we are all searching for a connection or, or reminding ourselves how much connection matters in that time that we were all kind of isolated. Um, so when I hear siblings, um, it, it, for me, you know, I've lost a brother um, and we were very close until we weren't. And then he passed away before we, so it, 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 it's always great to hear that siblings are close, even at our big ages. Um, where did you go to high school? I went to San Francisco University High School, which was a small private high school about uh, seven blocks from my house. Wow. And you went to, let me, let me see if any of my research work, you attended for undergrad Georgetown University? Yes. What, what, what degree did you earn there? I got a Bachelor's of Arts in Economics. Wow. And you moved on to earn an MBA from the Tuck School of Business at Dartmouth. Dart, Darth Mouth. Yes. Okay. Were you a good student? Um, only when I got to business school. Um, in, in high school, I was not a particularly good student. Um, I was on academic probation my freshman year at Georgetown uh, and graduated in the bottom half of my class. So huh. I was more of a, a late bloomer when it came to my academic career. And what call, it's always wonderful to hear that as well, because again, looking at the, not the end story, but where you are now, um, even I said certain things in the, in the opening. Um, and to, to, to hear the human life experience, that you, you can look outside, but you don't always know the details. How did you, what were the shifts for you, either externally or internally, or some combination thereof, that moved you from academic probation to doing just enough, perhaps, um, to taking grad school seriously? Yeah, the, the academic probation, you know, I, I really would have benefited from a year off before mm. going to college uh, and a little more maturity. And so living away from home, there were a lot of distractions. Huh. And, you know, what had gotten me through high school, which was, you know, listening to the teachers, occasionally doing some homework, um, didn't work out so well in college, especially in um, an advanced math program. I found myself in freshman year, and so I got a D. Mm. Um, got, did better second semester, I got a D plus. Um, oh. <laughs> but that had me shifting from being a math major <laughs> to an econ major. Um, oh, you began as a math major. Originally, I was okay. going to be. I still ended up with a minor in sure. math, but uh, I, I got scared off majoring in sure. math. So you, what did that D feel like? Did it feel that you, and I know this is a bit, but when that happened, where through high school you were able to kind of move through, did it catch you off guard? Did you accept, like, oh, no? Or did you go, it's just the universe around me. This is wrong. How did, how did, how did you react to that first sign of, this isn't quite as easy as I either thought or wanted to be? Um, you know, it, it definitely feel, felt like a fair grade uh, for how well I'd done in the class. Okay. Um, I, you know, I so you got were, Ds you were on the test. I got yourself. a D on the midterm. Okay. I got a D on the final. So it was, it was not a, a surprise. Okay. Um, I, I hadn't thought through the consequences of actually being put on academic probation. My parents reacted pretty firmly mm -hmm. to the whole thing. Some uh, angry calls with San Francisco. And so that got me more focused on getting on track and trying to develop better study habits. And I was a little successful, not hugely successful. Well, and then grad school, you just blossomed. It took off. Well, I had worked for two years between undergrad and oh, grad school okay. and worked for Merrill Lynch in a sort of banking training mm -hmm. program and worked, I don't know, 90 to 100 hours every week mm -hmm. and just got used to working really, really hard. So actually, by the time I got to business school, it was easy compared to work and I had developed much better habits. Okay. And the great thing in that dash moment, I'm assuming that a student who was on academic probation had a fair amount of resources to be able to find that professional opportunity. Um, How did you get that job? A friend of my sister's. Um, and this is, you know, as, as we think about it, a great example of networks and privilege. Um, I, I flamed out through on-campus recruiting. They, they looked at my GPA. I didn't get that many interviews sure. and didn't do that well. Um, my sister being two years ahead, you know, one of her classmates um, was doing some of the recruiting 
when he was at Merrill. So he had been in the analyst program, was now a second year. And so she got my resume in front of him and uh, that helped me get an offer. Got it. Switching gears a bit, who is Stephanie Hawkschild? Um, so less of a switch of gears. <laughs> Stephanie was someone who also worked at Merrill Lynch in the analyst program. <laughs> Um, and so wow. I met her at my first job, um, and we started going out sort of in the second year. When you first laid eyes on Stephanie, what did you think when you met your future, unbeknownst to you, then wife? Um, I thought she was very attractive. Okay. Um, Good start. And as I got to know her, I thought she was funny and well-read. Um, she was at, at the time dating her college boyfriend, sort of a big blonde lacrosse playing type oh, of guy. Okay. So I uh, sort of had to wait a while. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. Were you always waiting with intent that as soon as there was an opportunity or that you put it in the back of your mind and kismet, the, the, the things fell in place and you found each other? No, I was, I was always waiting. You were it. planning for yes, the beginning. Yes, That's what I, I was figured. Okay. lurking in Just, the periphery. Not in a creepy way. No, no. No, no, no. I don't no, want you to no, get no, wrong No, idea. no. No, I, yeah. I get Yeah. <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, and you two, uh, who said I love you first? Me. Of course. Okay. Um, you're the father, you and Stephanie, to three children. Yes. Tell me what it means to you to be their father. That's a really interesting question. Um, gosh, it, it's, it's such a strong emotion. It's hard to describe. But it, you know, they, they mean everything to, to Stephanie and I. And so it's sort of a feeling of you would do anything for them. You, you know, feel their pains. You're, you're proud of their accomplishments. And, you know, more than anything, I want, you know, if you ask me what was most important uh, to me, I'd say for the three of them to have, you know, happy and fulfilling lives. You're, uh, we talked about your first job. Um, Walk me through um, key points from that first role to where you sit today as director, president, CEO of Discover Financial Services. Give me some key um, turning points in, 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 that, in that trajectory from there to where we sit right now that you are running a global, a successful global company. Yeah. Um, so first I would say anyone who becomes CEO of a big company, um, if they're honest, they'd say a good degree of luck is involved, right? Okay. It's some skill, but you know, uh, usually it takes some, some lucky breaks and being in the right place at the right mm -hmm. time. And so for me, I never really um, looked for jobs sort of opportunities came my way mm -hmm. and I was lucky enough to make the most of those. So a couple of key ones. Um, I was working in Delaware for a company called MBNA America, which was a big credit card issuer. They've since been bought by Bank of America. Mm -hmm. I'd moved there, Steph and I had moved there from New York. It was quite a shock being in Delaware after being in Manhattan. I, uh, <laughs> no offense to, yeah, to Delaware. Uh, and, and my boss got recruited from there to go run Discover. And a couple months later, this would have been in uh, the fall of 1998, mm. he called me and said, do you want to come run marketing for Discover? And at that time, that job was the equivalent of my boss's 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 job. I was sort of running a group of about 30, 40 people. Mm. Um, and so I couldn't really say no. Right. Um, had never really um, spent much time in the Midwest or thought about living in the Midwest, but that was sort of a big break that moved me uh, a long way ahead in my mm -hmm. career mm -hmm. and first brought me to Discover. Wow. And so I, I'm going to assume it was a meteoric rise from, uh, you, you came in on a, on a good rung and, and, and earned your stripes and grew and learned. Talk to me about biggest lessons you learned from your entry to where you sit now and Discover. So it was, um, gosh, I started, I was 34. Mm -hmm. And no one at the company knew, because I was coming from the outside, no one knew how little I knew. Um, and uh, I was joking at an employee event, you know, we talk about the imposter syndrome, mm -hmm. right? I was actually an imposter. 
right? I had no idea what I was doing. Um, but a couple of things I learned. The most important thing is it's all about surrounding yourself with good people. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is your job as a leader. And if you have good people working for you, then everything will be easy. Mm -hmm. um, and you can help set direction, support them. Um, and if you don't, yeah, it won't be easy. So I was lucky enough to be at, at a very senior position at, at 34. Mm -hmm. um, I was only there a little over two years before I left to go work for our parent, Morgan Stanley. Okay. Um, and I was chief administrative officer of Morgan Stanley for a couple of years and then came back to Discover um, in, gosh, 2004 uh, as president. And so at that point, ha was president for 14 years before becoming CEO. Mm -hmm. So really, I've only had a few different jobs and spent most of my time at Discover in that role as, as number two to the CEO, mm -hmm. David Nels. Wow. So we have uh, here at, at CAN TV, and, and, and the, we're, we're really just mirroring conversations that are happening within our community. And we um, premiered recently, la a month or two ago, um, the first in our new docu-series called The Marginalized. And it was called Working While Black. And that begat a part two because the conversation was so layered and powerful and, 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 and we knew immediately as we were filming part one, there was a part two. There could easily be a three and four. And we were, we asked to come as we were looking at companies, how they're handling DEI. And we asked for a visit to your organization and you all invited us in. And we had conversations with your leadership, with staff, honest conversations. Um, and it, it, it really um, got us to thinking um, because in the documentary, one of the um, participants said that, you know, leaders who look like you, cis white males, um, um, may want to do the right thing, um, but have the privilege of not having to take the risk to do the right thing. So as we talk about um, the Chatham Call Center, and I'm going to ask you to read something for me. And this was recently, I believe, sometimes you did an, an op-ed. And you say something here, and I think it sort of sets a tone that I'd like you to repeat back, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, our experience in Chatham has been transformational. It has helped us better serve our customers and reinforce that while opportunity has not been evenly distributed in our country, talent has. I truly believe Chatham has benefited us more than we've benefited Chatham. I would encourage CEOs of other Chicago corporations to think differently about how you do business and use your platforms to advocate for change and bring job opportunities to our South and West Side communities. By offering quality full-time jobs, we can help close the racial wealth gap, fuel small business growth, and strengthen communities. Together, we can have a tangible impact on our city as we work to promote development, reduce crime, and create opportunities for all. Think about how amazing Chicago's economy can be if everyone fully participated in it. By investing in all of Chicago, we can do what is not only good for our city, but also good for business. Now is the time to act. So, You made a decision, because ultimately you're the CEO, and, and, and part of your business, a key part, is the, the, the call center operations. And I believe the last center you all had invested in launched from the ground up was nearly two decades ago yep. um, in Salt Lake City. And then we get to, which is key to your business, the call center. And you as a CEO either have to support it or suggest it that you opened up a call center in Chatham in what was formerly the space occupied by a big box. Yep. Um, was everybody thrilled about that? Um, you know, some people were. I think a lot of people questioned the decision. And from a conventional business logic, it, it was a bit of a stretch, mm -hmm. right? Because on one hand, we didn't need a new call center. Mm -hmm. Our call center in Columbus, Ohio, was only about 50% occupied. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if we hadn't done this, we wouldn't have sort of 
gone somewhere traditional mm -hmm. to open a call center. Uh, second thing was sort of the view on the south side of Chicago and is that the right place? Mm -hmm. You know, doesn't have class A buildings, not necessarily the right type of real estate, not where I would say a traditional site selection process would take you. Mm -hmm. So there, there was, I would say, some, some questioning of the decision. And your response to the questioning of the decision, how did you reinforce what, what, why did you want to do this? Why did you want to lead the organization in this? Um, I thought it was our responsibility. And a lot of companies talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion, mm -hmm. but you know, how many really try and do something mm -hmm. meaningful and do it within the construct of their business? Mm -hmm. Don't do it on the side. Yeah. And so this really came together with you know, my hearing Ibram Kendi speak, mm -hmm. right, on the importance of not just being not racist, but being an anti-racist and, and being a positive force for change. And then just thinking about systemic bias. And, you know, from my, you know, I won't say training as an economist, because given my grades, it wasn't really that. <laughs> I'm going to give you a pass. Um, but I'm always interested in process and yes. systems and how things work. And just think about how sort of um, inequity right, or inequality reinforces itself decade after decade, and that you need to take action to break the cycle. And I'd watched, you know, a, a very large company, you know, go from rich community to rich community to figure out who would pay them the most in incentives. Mm -hmm. and it just felt unfair. And so I thought, okay, what can Discover do? Well, we have great products and great jobs. Let's bring jobs to a community that's been underinvested in. And we don't have to look around the country. We can just look on the south and west side right here in Chicago. And let's do this as a company. And I was convinced that one way or another, it would work out great. Hmm. So, so you said a few things. And, and you and I, we've, we've had a conversation. And, and we both realized that we are not precious people, which is one more reason why I want you here. Why, why do you think, I can only ask you, you're sitting in a chair. You are saying things, and you're calling things what they are, and you're saying them. Why are you still the outlier of, of white men in leadership who go, well, it just, right is right, wrong is wrong. It doesn't matter if it impacts me directly or not for the betterment of my comp com company um, and for the betterment of all of us. Um, so it's easy on the back end because it's been a breathtaking success that I suspect You've learned things that you didn't even imagine on the front end about community um, and creating spaces. I spoke to some of your employees, and I shared with you a video. Um, and this is not um, this is not a, an advertising for your company. I'm talking about community issues that impact our community, and that's diversity, equity, and inclusion. Working while black. Um, working in spaces that are adjusting, not just saying let's do tons of recruitment and bring black and brown people in, but not adjust the culture to welcome and meet them where they are. It appears from all indications that that's what you all have done. Were there times during this where you worried that you had put your equity on the line because ultimately you did a CEO? Were there times that you won fear that this didn't work? And are there times now that you look at this and go, wow, what some saw as an experiment has the potential to change in such a dramatic way how we do business and how we implement DEI initiatives through the DNA. What, what lessons were learned here that you did not expect? Yeah, um, so first I would say, um, yeah, and I don't want to take away from the decision, mm -hmm. but I actually think the more privilege you have, the easier it is to take risks, right? I mean say I get fired, right? I've done very well at Discover. It's not like my family's gonna be homeless. Um, and, and I would say from the very beginning, our board of directors who are a, a diverse group mm -hmm. were 100% supportive. They never once asked about the cost and they just said, gosh, this is the greatest thing, keep us posted. So I had really strong support from a very important constituency for, for any CEO. Um, and I guess I tend to be optimistic. The, the underlying model, which is when, in a time where everyone is competing for employees mm -hmm. in the same locations, let's go to a location where we will be the employer of choice. Mm -hmm. 
And that just seemed to make so much sense to me that I was convinced this would work out well. And we, we have a lot of experience. Some things don't work well the first time, but then you keep at it, you reinvent, you find different ways, you innovate, and you figure out how to make it work. Mm -hmm. So it, it almost never crossed my mind that this would not work. I knew there'd be challenges, sure. but um, I, I was confident from the beginning. Okay. Uh, in 2020, and I, in 2020, your company created a new position, Chief Diversity Officer. Um, why and what do you um, look to that position to, to help you accomplish for your organization? Yeah, great question. First, I'd say we probably were a, a little late to the game. Okay. Um, it wasn't that we had, um, we didn't have diversity efforts before creating that position. But we wanted to up our game. And as with any other thing we try and do, we wanted measurable results. Mm -hmm. We wanted to see the representation, diverse representation at every level within the organization move up. And we wanted to see equal engagement scores for every group within Discover. Mm -hmm. We wanted everyone to feel equally good mm -hmm about the opportunities they had and, and that this is a place where they can be their, their true self. I usually at this point say to Chicago, um, let me leave you with a final thought for the road. Um, but what I'm going to say instead is I'm going to take a short um, break just to collect my thoughts. Um, Roger and I are going to continue this conversation on In the Arena Extra, available exclusively on our shiny, bright, new CanTV.org um, website. Visit us there to continue the conversation. In the meantime, I'm going to hand over the host chair to Roger and let him take us out with the final quote for the night. Ready to do it? I'm ready. All right. All right. All right. Thanks. Switch around. Switch around. Switch around. All right. Here we go. Oh, this is I gotta nice. try this. Oh, this is oh, great yeah. over here. Okay. A lot of pressure. All right. Okay. All right. All right. I'm not gonna mess up. He's not gonna mess up. All right. So Darius, let me leave you with a final thought for the road. Courtesy of American linguist Noam Chomsky. Responsibility, I believe, accrues through privilege. People like you and me have an unbelievable amount of privilege, and therefore we have a huge amount of responsibility. We live in free societies where we're not afraid of the police. We have extraordinary wealth available to us by global standards. If you have those things, then you have the kind of responsibility that a person does not have if he or she is slaving 70 hours a week to put food on the table. A responsibility, at the very least, to inform yourself about power. Beyond that, it is a question of whether you believe in moral certainties or not. So until next time, take good care of you and each other. Good night. How dare you be better than me? How dare you? I mean, thank you, Roger. Bravo. Wow. Of course, sir. Come on, brother.